So let us pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the church, fellowshipping with one another within this building. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you um, provide us the ability to share the Word of God and to discuss it in a very realistic way so that iron sharpens iron. We walk out of here and we're able to implement the Word of God in our lives in our thoughts, our actions, and behavior so that we bring you praise, honor, and glory at all times. Let us be our created best, not our creative best. Our created best. And our created best is simply that this broken person here can have right relationship with you through your son, Christ Jesus, and live by the power of the Holy Spirit and become a testimony to all those around us that God is real. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. 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 I'll tell you, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? That was beautiful. That was a mouthful. We're in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, and basically it it was concerning, the Apostle Paul was concerned because somebody in the Thessalonican church had spread a rumor that they had missed the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord starts the day after the rapture or actually starts right at the rapture, okay? Um, And I I don't know where you come from a theological standpoint, but I'm a pre-trib dude, okay? I believe that the church will be raptured before the um, tribulation begins. Now, other people, for whatever reason, they choose to believe it's a mid-trib rapture or a post-trib rapture. Well... They can stick around if they want, but not me, all right? <laughs> not me. I'm, I'm headed home. This is not my home. I'm just right. passing through. Just passing through. You know, I, look at when I, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and I entered into that right relationship with God, the Creator, um, my citizenship changed from this earth to heaven. And if you get there before I do, all right. I'm, I'm you better sorry. be waiting on me when I cross I know, Jordan. Okay. Well, look. <laughs> let me tell you what. Anytime you step out of the front door, you're you're you know, <laughs> you step out in this crazy world, and it's getting crazier all the time, yeah. isn't it? It's nuts. It's just. Look, if the Lord came before I finished, I would not be um, disappointed. However, just in sake. Just in case there's somebody here that doesn't know the Lord, let, put me on a 10-minute delay so I can share the gospel for 10 more minutes, and maybe both of us will be taken up, all right? Hallelujah. So, look at, um, there have been people throughout history who has been predicting the return of Jesus, the, the, the rapture. Okay, when he's, now it's not the second return, okay? The second coming is basically when he sets foot on earth. That's after the tribulation, you see. But he's going to rapture his church, those that are in relationship with him, with God, through him. Okay, they have faith. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but the world condemns itself because they refuse to accept me. Now, that's a paraphrase, okay? But it's exactly what it means. Uh, I was talking with an individual this morning. We were talking about good people and bad people. You see, good people and bad people. Good people don't go to heaven. Bad people don't go to hell. Okay? <laughs> Let me just put it this way. People that accepted Jesus go to heaven, and people that haven't accepted Jesus go to hell. Now, what is heaven? It's being in the presence of God for eternity. What is hell? Being separated from the presence of God for eternity. Okay? So let's just get that straight. Well, and if bad people go, then all of us are going to do yeah. Well, that's because we have all broken, right? <laughs> and if it's not for the grace of God, and the grace of God is simply how do I define it? Okay, and we've, we've taken really great steps to define it because, you see, there's a wrong grace that's floating around out there today. Grace doesn't... Okay, let me, let me just say, in God in love provides us an opportunity, provides humanity an opportunity to participate in his divine plan of salvation. And that divine plan of salvation, which he allows us to participate in, is something that we have not earned, nor do we deserve it. Now, that whole act of allowing us to participate in it is grace. It's not your participation. It's, it's not that, that, that offering, okay? You actually have to accept it by faith, Amen. okay? And so the way one is saved is by faith alone, okay? And the Bible says simply, uh, a lot of people are teaching grace this day and age, and they'll say you're saved through grace. 
and then they won't say the other half part, which is by f- through faith, or faith. you're saved through faith, faith or you're saved through gra- grace by faith. Amen. Okay, so what you actually have, yeah, you actually have a two-part sentence there in that scripture in Romans, and the first part has to do with the sovereign work of God. God's work in reference to sharing his plan of salvation and making it effective in time and history is finished. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. There's nothing else that has to be done on God's part to reconcile sinful man back to a holy God. Now, our only act that we have to do is to invest our faith, and all people have been given a measure of faith. Okay? All we have to do is have faith in God's plan of salvation. Accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Okay? Accept Him because, you see, He took your sin upon His shoulders. He didn't have to do it, did He? In fact, Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but Thy will be done. (laughs) Hey, if there's any other way, God, let's, let's get on with it. But there wasn't. And so today, in our brokenness, we can still be our created best. And being our created best is simply being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Allowing God to affect your every thought, every decision, and all your behavior. Your created best. Look, I am am working at becoming addicted to God. See, I'm going to be addicted to something because I'm part of the created. I'm going to be mastered by something or someone. It might as well be God, right? Amen. Amen. Now, when you come to grips that you're not God because only God's not mastered, when you come to grips that you're going to be mastered by something or someone and you get to choose who that something or someone is, I think I've got a grandchild running around here. Oh, <laughs> Is there a pen anywhere? I want to write some of the oh, stuff you're saying. Does somebody have an ink pen? I We're going to have it on. I'll tell you, it's going to be on recording, mm-hmm. and we'll give you. Oh, okay. okay. They're recording me. Yeah. I like what you're yeah. <laughs> and if I'm not saying the right things, I'll get thrown in jail. So I, I got I to gotta be careful, right, Tom? <laughs> um, there's been people now throughout history trying to predict when God or when Jesus and the rapture would happen. In fact, we hear it all the time, and I can't keep up with the dates, you know, and everybody keeps missing the dates. And, and so um, there are date setters, and the date setters are usually upsetters. All right? And there were some upsetters in the Thessalonican church that had kind of invaded that church. Now, Thessalonica, if, if you go back and you've been with us through the, the, the entire study of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, you'll find that it was kind of like a perfect church, uh, as perfect as a church could get with broken people. But they were out, they trusted in God, they were implementing the Word of God, they were listening to the Holy Spirit, and, and their faith was growing to the, to, to the degree that even individuals that weren't Christians were seeing their faith. And it was being demonstrated within that community. And, and so the Apostle Paul was writing them to, to make sure that they didn't get sidetracked to some degree. And also to encourage them to continue in the faith. To continue in doing what they were doing. And then in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, he's talking about individuals who have for whatever reason come in and they're trying to you know, upset things. Now when... It's my experience, and and we're experiencing it right now, that when you actually have a bunch of Christians, a whole bunch of churches here this morning, okay, because you're the church, we're all in fellowship, and when we, the church, are out working for God, Satan tries to mess things up. That's right. You know that? He tries to mess things up. And um, when, when you're doing something, now see, Satan's pretty smart. Because if you're not doing anything for the Lord, he just leaves you alone because he doesn't want to waste his energy on you. Why would he? Why should he? But if you're working, Fred, he's right there attacking you, trying to destroy you, okay? Finding false witness against you, 
things like that. And we have to be we have to be read up, prayed up, fellowshiped up, and fed up. Now we put fed up in there because Christians we eat a lot, okay, and, and we have to be fed up, okay, too. But um, the the first thing to do is make sure you read up, okay, because you, you've got to know the Word of God. Amen. All right, and if you if you don't know the Word of God, then you know it. it you, you just don't know who and how you're supposed to act. But when you read the Word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word and so forth, there's a renewing of the mind. And through that renewing of the mind, we get to learn what we're supposed to be doing and the way we're supposed to be acting as Christians, as followers. Uh, way back when, when Jesus was just after having ascended into heaven, they call it the way. The way. It wasn't called Christianity. The way. You follow the way. What way? The truth the life in the way, right? Follow Jesus. And so, see, Satan cannot do whatever he wants to do whenever he pleases to do it. He's still held in check. Even though he's smart, he's still held in check. And it's God's timetable that we're marching to, not <coughs> Satan's timetable. Satan knows that it's coming to an end. He just doesn't know when. And so he's out working hard trying to destroy everybody. Now, some he doesn't have to work hard at because they're willing participants in his plan of destruction. You see, they're involved in thoughts and activities and behavior which is counterproductive, destructive, and unless they repent, except Jesus Christ, they'll um, receive eternal damnation. But as Christians, if we're into the Word of God and we're learning, uh, and the Spirit is is dealing with us, then we're, we're, the activity that we're having and the, and the things that we sow should be productive and not counterproductive, should construct us as well as others, you know? And, of course, we know that, uh, like the Apostle Paul, uh, it's going to be great to be able to say, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to say this in faith, I have finished the fight. I have kept the faith. Yeah. I've done basically what God wanted me to do. And now there's a crown of righteousness laid up in heaven for me. Now, don't get too excited about that, okay? Especially the crown of righteousness, because if you've done a study of Revelation, sooner or later, what are we going to do, Dan? Toss those crowns. We're going to toss them at the righteous ones, the worthy ones' feet. We're going to take that crown of righteousness and we're going to just toss it at his feet. When they're asking around heaven... Who is worthy to take the scroll? Well, there's only one that's worthy, and that's Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And that's the title deed. The scroll is a title deed. What is it a title deed? It's going to reconcile all of creation back to God. Reconcile it all. Now, thank you, Jesus, because back on the cross, he said it was finished. And now, in time and history, the kingdom of God is at hand. And in that sense, we can be a participant in the kingdom of God. And how do you participate in the kingdom of God? Except Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit then comes to dwell within, and he starts giving you the wisdom and the advice and the power and the strength in order to implement the will of God. And the will of God always produces good fruits. You know, fruits that are, are, are um, going to build you up. Instead of bad fruits. Now, and let, if you haven't chosen to participate in the kingdom of God, well, then guess what kingdom you're participating in? Hmm? One that wants to destroy you. So how many are happy today that you're participating in the kingdom of God? Amen. Amen. Seeking first the kingdom. You know, in the Beatitudes, it talks about blessed is the man. Well, first of all, blessed is the man who is poor in spirit. That is, you understand from a biblical standpoint that there's nothing you personally can do to somehow bring about a right relationship between you as a sinful individual and God as a holy God. There's nothing you can do. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't trade for it. You can't steal it. All right? But God gave his son, and everything's been paid for, and the check didn't bounce. You can't work your way in. A lot of people out there trying to work their way in. Let me say this because a lot of people misinterpret. If you choose to invest your faith, that's not a work. That's an act of participation. Investing your faith is not a work. 
okay? Now, to take your faith and put it into, into, into some type of human endeavor to try to somehow bring about your salvation is a work. But when you participate by investing your faith in God's plan, that's an act of participation. It's not a work. It's simply laying it down and saying, I can't do this. Can't do this. Is my father's book over here someplace? Can you find if you find it? And I've been saying I can't do it for a long, long time. If you can find me one, that would be great. I, I don't want you to th Let me say this. Satan is active alive in this world, but he cannot do whatever he wants to do whenever he pleases to do it. He can't, okay? God is in control, and God is bringing about things in his timing. Just like Jesus, I, it, it's hard for me to understand why the fullness of time was 2,000 years ago. I would say, okay, this would have been pretty cool had the fullness of time been now. Just think, Jesus could have been on the airwaves and all this stuff. No. Mm -hmm. See, God in his infinite wisdom knows the right time. Amen. When that time is going to be the most efficient and most effective to reach the most individuals, God's desire is simply that none should perish. And that's why he has mercy. See, if God didn't have mercy, Fred, we, we wouldn't even be the recipients of grace. Right. You know that? Because um, mercy is simply my definition in love. Because, you see, God is love, so everything <coughs> he does is in love. You, so you, have to, you can't separate anything that God does without expressing his love. God is love. In love, God withholds what we've earned and deserve, and that is righteous judgment. That's so cool that he's withholding. Hey, Mr. Willie, you got your hand up. Yeah. Um, two examples. One is Job. The other are the two men on the cross next to Christ. The one tells him, you know, you're Christ, bring down your angels, and the other one says... Take me, can I, I want to join you. And he says, this day you shall be with me. In paradise. Another one just sat there and mocked God, and mocked everybody, and all that good stuff. And, you know, you know, how can I say this? It's one thing to be disobedient in your own behavior, but then you, when you, when you, Actively, willingly, and wantingly set out to suppress the Word of God, you're in a whole different ballpark. Whole different ballpark. And God will deal with that. When you mock men of God, you mock God, you mock the Word of God, God will deal with it, and He'll deal with it quickly. All right? And so, it's one thing to be disobedient. It's another thing to be in your disobedience, individuals who suppress the truth. And, and we read about those individuals within the Bible. Well, we talked about uh, the big book of Jude. All right? It might take you a week to read it. Or let me put it, it might take you an hour to read it, but it will take you several months to study it. <laughs> Just remember that the Word of God encourages us to Read the word of God to, no, it says study to show thyself. Don't read to study to show, study. Study means that you, well, you get out all the books, you take time to comprehend and let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you, right? Study. Let me read you. See, I, I gave it up a long time ago. Years ago when I was a child, about six years old, my father taught me to ride a bicycle. This was a horrible experience. <laughs> Not because he was the teacher, but because the training track he chose. It was horrible because of the training track that he chose. It was an old Colorado mountain trail with rocks and ruts. Back then it was called a road. I remember it very well. By the time we reached our destination, a highway store at the beginning of the road that had now become my training track, my forearms were bruised and battered as well as bleeding from the scrapes and scratches received from all the falls along the way. The store was a welcome sight. I found the smooth highway leading up to it and the paved parking lot much easier to ride on. It was fun riding fast and keeping my balance all at the same time. However, 
there was a problem. I had not learned how to correctly stop. Oh, no. Don't try this. I ran smack dab into a parked car in the store's parking lot. Later on, I learned about the brakes. <laughs> Dad picked me up, brushed me off, and then took me into the store where he bought me some candy. While in the store, the candy helped make my pain go away. This was a temporary fix because we still had to complete the ride home. With candy in my tummy, we started back. I quickly discovered the trip back to the cabin wasn't going to be any easier. The difficult training track had not changed. After several falls and once again covered with dirt and with lines drawn in the dust from the tears running down my face, the candy in my tummy long gone, I gave up. It was at this time, while down on the ground, looking, looking face up with my hands and arms raised towards heaven, I said, Lord, I will never make it. I was six years old. <laughs> now, later in life, I realized how true that confession was, and I believe my father made the same confession in his teens. He realized that the only way he could make it uh, was in dedicating his life to God. Throughout his entire life, he fought the fight, kept the faith, and he now has finished the course. My father died January 4th, 2003. My father was a great teacher. I got back on my bicycle and have been riding by, uh, the roads of life now uh, ever since. This lesson taught years ago was more than just about how to ride a bicycle. It was learning that dedicating your life to God through his son, Jesus Christ, is how one makes it through life. My father has made it to his reward, and I am looking forward to riding with him again. However, this time will be on paved streets of gold. So that's what I wrote in the, in the, in the back of the book. Um, when we understand that blessed is he who is poor in spirit, that is, we can't bring somehow about our own salvation. When we surrender all, when we surrender all, then God can take this clay and mold me and make me in his in, in, in the way that he sees fit, which is the best way. Now, he's coming back for those that have been made in his way, okay? And we're broken, but we can be our created best. We can serve God because of his Holy Spirit. He's coming back for us, and somehow somebody told these Thessalonians uh, at this church that uh, they had missed the day of the Lord, and they were greatly concerned. And... Uh, the Apostle Paul simply says, look, it, there's a timetable, and that timetable is this. It's, he, he says it here, and, um, and basically they, they, were, they were thinking, well, did God change his plan? No, God still has the same plan. His plan is the best plan, and therefore it never changes. Uh, what was going through the man, their minds maybe, what, had God changed his plan and... and um, but he hadn't. And to calm their hearts and stabilize their faith, Paul explained that they were not in the day of the Lord. And, this, and the reason was simple. The day could not arrive till certain other events had taken place. Now, if you read that entire portion of Scripture, we'll find out in 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Somebody, if you would, read that out loud. See, I used to say just somebody read it. And they would read it. And Well, we're reading it, but they wouldn't read it out loud, so it didn't do us any good, did it? So you have to read it out loud. First Thessalonians, second, uh, second chapter, verse 1, and then verse 6 and 7. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. You said 6 through 1? 6 and 7 now. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only who, who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Okay, and somebody have the NIV? Read it, Mr. Dan. Uh, 1 and 2 and 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So right there he said, somebody has accused us of teaching that the day of the Lord has already come. And he's, he's just setting the record straight. All right. Did you ever have to set a record straight? Huh? <laughs> you know what that means then, huh? 
Go ahead and read the rest of it. Verse 6, And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. Well, first of all, Satan's already at work. But he, he, he can't really go gung-ho until what is taken out of the way. Church believers. Huh? The church. Okay. Now, some theologians say it's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? And some theologians say it's the church. Who's the church? We are. We are. We are. You are. And, and what do we do while we're here on earth? Huh? Well, let's talk about that because I think it's really important. First of all, we plant seed. That's our primary purpose, right? Planting seed. Planting seed is basically giving people the opportunity to hear the good news. The good news is that Jesus died for you. Now, we don't take a 357 Magnum or we don't take a baseball bat, and we don't hold people, uh, you know, we, we offer it freely, all right? And some, sometimes when you start sharing the gospel, people tell you, shut up. Okay, I'll shut up. Okay, I'll shut up. And, and a lot of times when we witness, uh, we use words. But most of the time we use our behavior, our actions, and people see God working in us and through us, Okay? And I, I don't know about you, but I've had people come up and say, man, you reacted differently to this. So what's up with you? And I'll say, okay, well, let me tell you what, what makes my clock tick. Jesus Christ, okay? A lot of times I don't get angry. Some people say, man, Gary, you've got so much patience. Well, the reason you've got patience is, hey, Tom, you've said that more than once. You said, man, if it was me, I'd take that baseball bat. We, we just recently had kind of a conversation like that, right? <laughs> and then I, I remember Tom and I, have had we've had secret conversations in like in little hallways, okay? And you know what I'm talking about. Okay, and I said, okay, I got this, Tom. I got this. Let me say there is a time for a baseball bat. Yes, we call that direct confrontation. And if you, we have a class we call either size, and that's where you get fed physically and spiritually. We made up a word. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was good at making up words. And so we call either size, and we come and we just digest the word. We, we tear it apart. We put it back together. And we went through a class called um, um, confrontation how to have proper confrontation. <laughs> Has anybody ever been in confrontation around here? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I've got everybody going, yeah, like this. See? They don't know what you're saying or doing physically in these recordings. They just hear me talking, and they're saying, boy, <laughs> they need a good, good speaker. See, that's what they say. Didn't Aaron call that the Bethel Beatdown? The Bethel Beatdown. <laughs> There's wise questioning. Sometimes you can just ask questions and, and confront. Then there's another way um, that you sometimes share a parable, uh, a heavenly story that has an earthly meaning. Sometimes you actually share the story of the individual, and then by the time they get around to the end, or you, by the time you get around to the end of it, then they, the individual that you're sharing it with actually realizes, it's, it's, hey, you're talking about me. And a good example of that was when Nathan the prophet went to David and gave him this story and, and, and he asked David what should be done with this man. And David said, hey, that guy should be killed for what he's done. And then said, that, well, that man's you, David. <laughs> that man's you. And then there's direct confrontation or rebuke. Have you ever had that direct confrontation or rebuke? And sometimes godly men... God will send a prophet or a godly counsel to a person for direct rebuke. And if, if you're in that spot, it's uncomfortable. But take heed. Take heed. Because it's normally the Holy Spirit speaking through that individual directly to you. And the purpose for that is to keep you from going astray and, and actually experiencing all the stuff that you don't need to experience. God doesn't want you to hurt. God doesn't want you to experience things that are 
going to be destructive. And, and so if you're on this path of destruction, uh, you might say, Gary, have you ever had to do a direct rebuke? Well, there's a couple times, okay? And I think about my son, okay? It was approximately, oh, August 20th of last year, and I had to do a direct rebuke to him. And I said, son, unless you change, you, you know the truth. You know the truth. And unless you change your behavior and you start submitting your life back to God, then your, your way is going to be rough. Your way is going to be tough. Yes. In Hebrews, uh, it says, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So... It's written. That's hard to believe. It's hard to understand that and to accept it when you're the child, right? Remember, mom and dad, hopefully you had a good mom and dad. Not everybody has a good mom and dad, okay? But hopefully in your upbringing and when, you know, my dad used to, <laughs> my dad used to, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's a different kind of hurt. Yeah. One's a physical hurt, the other. Yeah. Heart well, let me tell you what. I didn't believe that until I had children. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> you laughed. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so um, I remember that night, and I said, "Don't go to Houston. Don't go to Houston." Well, he got to Dallas, and. He, told me that he was going to Virginia, and then I called him the next day. I said, where are you at? And he says, I'm just outside of Houston. I said, you lied to me. You just, you know? And, uh, and so uh, basically I rebuked him by the power of the Holy Spirit. He chose to do what he did. And yes, if you would, please. Thank you. And... Um, Today he's in Summit County, Akron, Ohio, jail, waiting to be sentenced um, for four different felonies. Now, that doesn't make me happy, <coughs> okay? But I ain't lying to you. If that's the way to get a hold of my son, then God, <coughs> you do your thing. Amen. 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 Because you see, what happens in time in history is just for a short period of time, but we're talking about eternity. All right. Now, I certainly believe that had he listened to that rebuke, he would be in a different position today, <coughs> different situation. I talked with him yesterday. I said, what's going on? He said, everything. It's just the same old, same old every day. Nothing changes. You know, he can't text Thank you, Jesus. He can't do any sexting on his phone. Thank you, Jesus. He can't look at any pornography on his phone. Thank you, Jesus. He can't drink his alcohol. Thank you, Jesus. And you know what he's doing now? Reading Thank you, Jesus. He's reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. He's in Jeremiah. I said, well, that's who you were named after. The <laughs> Lord's doing the work. The Lord's doing work. Now, the work, real work will be when he gets out of jail to see if Jesus is still with him. Okay? You see what I'm talking about? Right? I know exactly what you're talking about. We've gone through that road too many times. Too many times. Yeah. And um, let me just say this, too. There's another stepchild of mine today in jail. He can't text, thank you, Jesus. He can't sext him on his text. Thank you, Jesus. He can't look at pornography. Thank you, Jesus. He can't drink. Thank you, Jesus. He can't do his drug. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? And now I'm just hoping he'll open the Bible. And if I have anything to do with it, he will. That's great. He was here last week. Remember, he's the one that doesn't have shorts on. Sand in his shorts. Yeah, the one that had uh, sand in his shorts. I tell you what, God knows how to deal with Amen. people. Okay? <laughs> Shorts on um, with whatever happened, obviously, he did have shorts on. Okay, so you know what? I don't thank the Lord because uh, let me just say this I, I want to make sure that everyone here understands where I'm coming from. I don't want anybody to experience anything negative. 
But if that's what's required to get you on your knees and praying to God. My prayer was simply this to my oldest son and to my stepson. Lord, do whatever is necessary to get their attention, but don't take their lives nor, do, nor allow them to take the life of anybody else. Okay? Now, Job was a man, you know, Job was right there. He, he was next to God so much so that Satan said, hey, if you take your heads of protection away from this man, he'll fall flat on his face. He'll curse you. And God says, do what you want to do, but don't take his life. Job even got down to the point that he had lost everything. In fact, he even contemplated in his speech what he could do in reference to cursing God. But you know what? He had a little help from his wife. Well... <laughs> That's right. That's well, I found out a long time ago when you go to the bar and you have a lot of money, everybody's a friend. But when your money runs out, you ain't you don't have any friends. Okay. Not even the waitress. Not even. <laughs> okay, Jerry, we're not going there this morning. All right, we're not going there. You can't keep her. She don't want you either. Let me tell you. So, God has a way, and it, God. I serve such a good God that he will, he will allow things to happen in such a way that it will give you the best opportunity and maximize the potential of you saying yes to him. Okay? Yes to him. He never stacks a deck against you. Now, I know people who try to stack the deck against you, okay? They try to make your way difficult and hard. No, that's not God. God allows whatever is necessary to come your way so that it will maximize your potential, your opportunity, your possibility to say yes to him. Yes, you've got a scripture. Yeah, Hebrews 12.11. Oh, we're back into Hebrews. No, no, no chastening <laughs> seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. Okay, so... so uh, Satan can't get on with what he wants to do during the rapture until the, or excuse me, during the tribulation until the rapture happens. That's that's what, and the day of the Lord starts at the time in which the church is taken out. Now, you and I were the church. Let me say this: it, we know the Holy Spirit is still work at work during the rapture because there are people that will be saved during the rap, uh, excuse me, during the tribulation. There are people that are going to be saved during the tribulation. So we know, and we know that the beckoning call of the Holy Spirit is what draws you to say yes to Jesus. Yeah. Okay? And, and how do we know that? Well, because you see, uh, Revelation gives us a glimpse of those that have died during the tribulation, and they're under the altar crying out for vengeance, aren't they? So you say, Pastor, your, your theology is incorrect. We know the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the period of time of <coughs> tribulation. Well, tell me how those souls get underneath the altar then, all right? You see, you just can't choose, and you've you got to go with, well, it starts at the front of the book and ends at the back of the book, okay? You've got to take the whole Bible and, and take a look at what it's saying. So, it, yes? If I might add, with your ministry, it reminds me of a scripture that I embed in my heart about pre rapture. Mm -hmm. Watch ye therefore and pray always that he may be able to escape the things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So that in order to escape, that is our, our escape. Yeah. It's and watching is just not... Okay, watching is an active, active watching. Yes. Yeah, that's great scripture. I mean, any scripture is great. Mm -hmm. And just because I say it's great doesn't make it great. It's great because it is the Word of God. Amen. And it works with, in spite of me. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm expecting the Lord to come back. I'm expecting to go home with Him. And I'm expecting... Okay, look at You think we eat well down here, the Mary's Supper of the Lamb? <laughs> going to be watermelon there. Uh, and a lot of salt. Be, <laughs> with salt <laughs> and your salt <laughs> ice cream okay and, and let me just say this too because you guys know that I'm not a mega church person okay let me tell you what I am the, it, as far as I can tell the only mega church that's in the Bible is when we all get to heaven okay when we all get to heaven 
And if, if, if the secular world thought that one big store worked better than a lot of little stores, they would have one big store. Think about it, 7-Eleven. They got a 7-Eleven almost on every corner. Starbucks. Starbucks started out with one store, then they got two stores, and they got three. They don't have just, okay, if Starbucks thought that one mega Starbucks would do the job, they would put a mega Starbucks right downtown Denver, and everybody could come there for their coffee. And pay $8 a cup. <laughs> Boy, they really sold one on the people. You know that eight dollars? Is that what it costs? Eight something for a chocolate small mocha, uh, mocha or something. I have. Sounds like you got experience in wasting your money. Yeah. That my gift card went. <laughs> if Seven Eleven thought that one big store downtown would make it happen. They wouldn't have a store on every corner. But let me tell you how the church is supposed to work. You're supposed to have a church on every corner. You're the church. And the more churches you have, the more influence you have. You can plant seed better. Okay? If I had to make a church of 1,000 people, we'd plant 10 churches. And when they got to 1,000, we'd plant another 10 churches. And that's just me, okay? I, that's my own opinion. I have to tell you what my opinion is. Okay? My opinion is, is that in business, you divide and you make departments, and then you have within those departments, you have other departments, you divide so that you can. What's the purpose of business? Is sell your product. Okay? And the way you do that is by franchising and making more departments and making, you know, Ford doesn't have just one big shopping. You know, a lot where you come and buy a truck. No, they got dealers in all the cities. And so, unfortunately, the church is taking the wrong approach. In my opinion, we need to make more little fellowship groups that can go out and reach within a mile of their circle everybody <coughs> with the good news. You like that? I like it. I like it. And then when we get raptured, the church is out of here. And you see, we still have opportunity to kind of withhold to some degree um, individuals who are in power and who are empowered by Satan. Okay? One of the things that, and I don't want to get into politics, but one of the most important things that the president does anymore this day and age is to appoint Supreme Court justices. Now, I may not like the person, but if they're going to support a Supreme Court justice who will at least judge to some degree better biblically, then I'm all for that person. Okay? And I'm so sick and tired of judges taking within their own power to reinterpret the laws. And I'm just going to get off of that right now, okay? But let me tell you what. We need godly people in high places Amen. to slow down Satan's attack and advance. Now, um, we do recognize this, that things are going to wax worse. The Bible says that. Until the church is pulled out, and then for three and a half years, it's going to be, okay, it's going to be kumbaya time. You know, back some of us, 60s and 70s, huh? All right. Remember that okay. song? Uh, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Something like that, okay? And those of us old time hippies here. <laughs> Was you a hippie? Huh? No, you were no, never a hippie? No. Oh, you didn't have the bell bottom jeans and the little love beads Sherry and, was. you know, and the peace. peace was. <laughs> Who was? Sherry was. Sherry! You got any pictures? No. I want to see the pictures. <laughs> Those were my young and dumb days. <laughs> young and dumb. <laughs> and he was oh. dumb and dumber. Dumb and dumb. Dumb and dumber. <laughs> Confession's good for the soul. I want you to know, okay? Confession is good for the soul. Are we having fun? Yes. You guys having fun? Yes. That's what church is all supposed to be about. You know, Gary, we went to tell you right one time, and... Has there anybody ever been there? Oh, yeah. But you go in there, and all of the people that own the stores and the grocery stores and liquor stores, 
are all hippies from the 70s. Mm -hmm. They all have long hair. And they're real nice people. Well, you know I'm not a hippie. You used to be. <laughs> 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 I've seen your pictures. <laughs> There's evidence that's been left behind, trust me. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So look at that. That's that's a good testimony. See, your your past is your past. You can't change it, can you? You can't change it. And unless there's God in it now, then it's just your past. It it doesn't it doesn't say much other than maybe you were a bad dude or whatever. But when you put Jesus in it. <laughs> It becomes not your past, but your testimony. Mm -hmm. exactly. So somebody told me, Gary, prove to me that God in, exists. And I says, well, you know, there's a physical, metaphysical. And they said, no, I want to know th empirically, can you prove that God exists? And I said, yes. And you know how I prove that God exists? Yeah. Empirically. You've been changed. Amen? Amen. And what changed Amen. you? Jesus. Hmm? Mm -hmm. God. That's the only way a person changes. And so I can empirically prove that God exists through the very miracle. The greatest miracle that ever takes place is taking a sinful man making reconciled to a holy God. Only God can do that. And today, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you've been reconciled. You don't have a reconciled body. In your morality, you're still becoming like Christ, so it's not totally reconciled. Okay, but you have the potential because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. This new cheap grace says that you're not only you're spiritually reconciled, but you're morally reconciled immediately, so you don't have to work on that. And I say, no. Okay? Something about you'll know them by their... Okay, so if you got stinky fruit, don't tell me. Okay, tell me who your Lord is. Okay? Not only your Savior, but tell me who your Lord is. Who's your master? Okay? Mine is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Some people are mastered by... You name it. But if I'm going to invest my faith and be mastered by something or someone, it's going to be God. It's going to be God. And God changes me. And I don't change God. See, some people, they get this understanding that you become a Christian and all of a sudden you interpret the Word of God so that God fits in your box instead of you fitting in His universe. And all of a sudden, if that's the case, then who becomes God? Mm -hmm. Huh? You just usurped the authority of God. So you haven't missed the day of the Lord. The rapture has to happen first, and then the lawless one has to come on the scene, according to the scripture. Now we know that the first three and a half years of the tribulation is going to be peace. Everybody's going to get sucked in. And let me tell you what, there's a lot of sucking in going on right now. Yes. Our government's teaching people to be in, uh, enabled, not enabled, not at all enabled, but to be dependent. The Christian church is being, let me say this, it says to study to show yourself approved. Who's doing the studying here? The individual. And we're being led to the slaughter, okay? In this sense, some people are being led to the slaughter like sheep in the sense that they're depending on someone to teach them. And they're being taught wrong. Being taught wrong? Look, we don't talk about church dogma around here. We talk about what is written. And if it's not written, it doesn't need part of the church, right? That's right. Amen. So we have to get rid of a lot of bad stuff that's happened. Let me, we live in such a phenomenal period of time. We have so many resources at our fingertips. I'm thinking, you know, John Calvin could live today he probably would never talk about the tulip theory. Okay? So I don't... Look, it, he was a man after God's heart. There's no doubt about that. 
All right. Some of the theologians would probably change some of their theories or theological interpretation of the Word of God. Because we, you know what? I can type in Tom in my word search in the Bible, and if there's any Toms in there, it would show it to me immediately. The theologians that lived after, after Martin Luther penned the 95 Theses on the, on the Roman Catholic Church door and, and walked away from the Catholic Church, he didn't have a computer to research. I am amazed at how much work these individuals did the old-fashioned way. They wrote everything out by hand. You know, I started typing. Uh, my typewriter wasn't very good. It was a manual typewriter. It didn't have a correction tape to it. All right, so I took a security job in big high rise with a whole bunch of attorneys, and they had the IBM Select for twos <laughs> with correction tape. We didn't even have calculators. I know it. I used a slide ruler. Anybody know what a slide ruler is? Huh? Oh yeah. Had to work it all out with a slide ruler, and then somebody came up with a Hewler Packet four function calculator. It was about the size of my Bible <laughs> as far as top to bottom, but it was about that thick, and it could do add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Four-function Hewlett Packard. They'd come out of Texas. And okay, expensive. Cost about $700 back in the early 70s. Uh -huh. And I had an old Polish boy that had one on his hip. And he'd come to school, and he was prouder than a peacock. And he pulled that puppy out and said, what do you got? He says, I got the next best thing. <laughs> and so we were given the equation to do and we were here on our sliding deals and he was punching buttons and we came up with it faster than he did <laughs> and we laughed and the computer that I worked on was nothing but um, vacuum tubes and it was in a room about the size of the room that you're sitting in and it could do less than about 2k <laughs> remember the old Commodore 64's mm -hmm. yep. okay we're so privileged. We got all this technology, but we use it to dirty the mind instead of clean the mind. It went to the moon on four megabytes. Now. Moon on four megabytes. <laughs> and, and, of course, the, the one deal where they had a problem, okay, and there was an explosion, they had to get people back, what was it, Apollo 13, I believe? Yes. They had to figure out how to turn that whole thing on in less than about two milliamps. And they figured it out, and they got the men home, all right? So you see, we have the tools. Mm -hmm. We have the ability, but we just invest it wrong. Invested in things of God, it will pay dividends. It says, cast your bread on the water, and it won't return back void. And I always used to think about that as being positive. Well, let me just say, whatever you cast on the water, it's going to come back. What you sow, you reap. That's a law. Whether you believe in God, it's going to happen. You want to reap bad, you, you want to reap disobedience, you reap what, if you sow disobedience, you reap stinky or bad fruit. That's just my way of saying it. It's, it's fruit that's counterproductive, destructive, and leads to eternal damnation. That's explaining therapeutically. But if you sow obedience, if you let the Holy Spirit lead you, you're, you're on page with me here. Got to let the Holy Spirit lead you. Amen? Amen? And if you do, then you get fruit of obedience. And it's constructive. It builds you up. It helps build up those around you. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it leads to eternal life. Amen. Amen? Amen? I'm on my way. I'm 63 years closer to my date of rapture. All right? Than I was when I was first born. I know I'm old. I know. And I tell you what, this arm tells me I'm old today. Okay. Go downstairs. Let me say this. I want to, I want, I've got to close. We never get very far in stuff like this because we just, we just love to have fun. I believe in having fun. Amen? Amen. And, and, and look at I can study all week long and I can give you so much you can choke on it. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to just chew our cud. In the way of oak out. Just take a little bit and chew it, digest it, think about it, reiterate it, you know, talk about it, iron sharpens iron type stuff, okay? And then we walk out of here better off. That's right. All right? 
instead of trying to just impress somebody. Okay, we're not here. There's, there's a statement that I haven't used a lot, but I've used it a lot in my ministry. I'm not here to impress. I'm here to bless. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. If you want to get impressed, then don't come here. But if you want to get blessed, then I believe God is here to bless you. Even if it's through somebody like me. All right. This week, we worked really, really hard. You know, we're in the process of kind of going through a change. Um, and so we started, um, we textured the walls downstairs in the reception area with a heavy knockdown texture. What a, what a mess it was. We have pictures. Okay. And then we painted it all one color. It's beautiful. And then we put up trim, and Jerry came over and did some um, s um, concrete work for us. And Jerry, it looks fine. It looks great. Okay. Um, Robert and Lena have worked their backsides off with me this week. I mean, those guys have been here every day with me working. I came down thinking, okay, what I'll do is I'll work one day. I'll stay here the night. I had one change of clothes, and then I'll go back the next day. Well, it just took... Look, I'm old. You're right. I don't work nearly as fast. I can't accomplish nearly as much as quickly as I used to. But we got it done. All we have left is a little hallway back there to paint. And then I'm going to have the building people come over, and they're going to tell me what we need to do to have people stay here. And we're going to get a plan, okay, to where we can help people. You see? Or we'll do whatever God wants us to do. How God... <laughs> That I'll take his call after oh, you'll just put him on hold. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's his birthday today. <laughs> Whose birthday? It's Tom's birthday. Oh man, are you in trouble, Dad? <laughs> Happy birthday, Tom. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. Thomas. Happy birthday to you. And and let me say this: we everybody, you know, we decorated the tree, and I got mad at Steve, and I had to have a conference with that boy, and he just laughed, and he says, "Okay, now you can appreciate me and you do whatever, because that tree is it's a big tree, it and is. Steve, that was his project. He would jump on that right away, and I was thinking about that, yes." It don't look as pretty as when Steve used to do it. Oh, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> you have to understand he was a... work on that a little bit. You have to, you have to understand. I was going to okay. try to make it the other night, but I was so sore. <laughs> Me and you, you both. You have to understand this. He was a journeyman. I'm apprentice when it comes to decorating trees. I had, a, I had every intention to be here on Friday. Though. I did, but they broke into my truck on Thursday night. See, Satan's fighting. Satan's fighting because Satan wants what you've got. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes. And, 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 um, and, and here's, here's just, it's so easy to lose it when somebody takes something you've worked hard for. But I'm learning to be content. I am really trying to be content. Because you see, it's his. It's not mine. But I'll tell you, I struggle with that one, too. I really struggle with it. I have choice words. That's when I need to make sure my dentures have been baptized in whatever cleaning solution so I don't say dirty words the next day. Okay, that's good. That's good. Dismiss us in prayer, young lady. Can you do that for me? Amen. You'll do better than that. Heavenly Father, we are gathered here today to thank you for all the blessings that you give us every day. And we want to thank you for the light of, for the light that you send us, which is Jesus Christ, your Son, and for sending us the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus to cover us. We thank you, Lord, for everything you have done for us, and we still thank you today. Amen. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, go forth this week. We're going to have a few songs to sing. I believe we got communion. Yes, we got communion. Okay, and so we're just going to worship and praise the Lord for the next 30 minutes. God bless.